Apple II wire-by-wire -wire build, text mode video. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. People do sometimes ask me why I focus on such old machines, and the answer is probably similar to the reason that people restore old cars. They come from an era where it was easy to work on them, and they're beautiful in their full glory. At least they are to fellow nerds. I'll put a link to this Corvette restoration in the description below. The Apple II itself had four display modes, a high res, text, low res, and a mixed display mode. And it does beg the question, why have these different modes? Can't we just do text in high res mode? The ZX Spectrum, for example, just had a single high res mode, and all text was done through high res mode. By the way, happy 40th birthday ZX Spectrum. So we know Steve Wozniak was a master at reducing chip counts. Why spend all the extra hardware on a character generator? I suspect at least in part it's got to do with scrolling speed. The Apple II has a 6502 CPU running at 1 MHz. The inner loop of the scrolling routine requires us to read a byte from memory, write it back, decrement some sort of counter, and then branch if appropriate. The number of clock cycles for each instruction is shown on the right. Absolute Y is probably the fastest, but it will actually require self-modifying code. In high-res mode, we need to transfer 7,680 bytes for a scroll. This leads to 99,840 CPU cycles, which means at full speed the CPU could do it at approximately 10 frames per second. This means to scroll an entire page, one row at a time, would take two and a half seconds. Now that's pretty unacceptable. If we add in a hardware character generator, we only need to transfer 960 bytes per frame. So the same code can run at about 80 frames a second, which means you could scroll an entire screen in about a quarter of a second. Much better. By way of comparison, the ZX Spectrum, which only had a high-res mode, had a Z80 clocked at 3.58 MHz. Now, the Z80 had some instructions to make data transfer very efficient. One of them was the LDDR instruction. It could transfer up to 64K bytes in one instruction, and it required 21 clock cycles per transfer. So to do a scroll in the spectrum with the active area, as well as its mask, we had to transfer 6912 bytes. This required 145,152 CPU cycles, and it meant that the machine could scroll at a frame rate of 24.6 frames per second. By contrast, the Commodore 64 had a 6510 running at 1 MHz, but it had hardware scrolling. So in theory, you could scroll the screen every scan line, and possibly even more often if you wanted to. Jumping back to the Apple again, the video display mode was selected by some soft switches located at the C1000 page. I'll go over this in a lot more detail in an upcoming video. In text mode, the data to be displayed is located at 4000 to 7FF hex. And this is for a 40 character by 24 row display. But let's have a look at the sequence in high res mode. If we remove the relative line number and convert each set of eight lines into a single row, then if we modify address lines A10 through A13 in the base address, we end up with the same mapping as text mode. So this means we have to do something else with the relative line number, and we have to fiddle with some address lines to get the same raster generator to work in text mode. Here's a block diagram for the machine that we've built so far. And what I'm proposing we do is we add in a character generator EEPROM before the shift register and tap off a couple of address lines from the address bus to control it. This is combined with our byte read from the main memory, which leads to the bit pattern that can be fed directly into the shift register. Adding the character set EEPROM is actually pretty straightforward. I just need to put it between the data bus latch and the shift register. Technically, it's a data bus D type flip flop. There is a difference between latches and flip flops. That is, latches are level sensitive, while flip flops are edge sensitive. The EEPROM I'm using is actually much bigger than I need, so I'm just going to tie all these excess address signals to ground. I'm going to try something different with this build. I'm going to talk over the top of it rather than play music. Let me know in the comments which one you prefer. First of all, I need to install the sockets for the character generator EEPROM and the multiplexer, which I'll discuss a bit later in the video. As usual, I need to hook up power and ground to these chips. I'm not sure why, but connecting power and ground always seems to take a long time. 
This is going to be a bit delicate. I need to disconnect the wires between the 74HC374 and the shift register, which is the 74HC165. And these are the signals I'm going to run through the character generator EEPROM. I have a bit of a personal preference when it comes to wire colouring. I tend to use red for data and blue for addresses. Here, through this octal D-type flip-flop, the data turns back into address, so I'm going to turn these red input signals into blue output signals. Those that have done quite a bit of wiring note that I didn't actually start on A0 on the EEPROM. And that's because I'm going to use lines A0, A1 and A2 as the line number, which comes from a different part of the circuit. I'm using a bit of a construction trick here. I'm going to install one address line and one data line, which I've dutifully checked. I know that these pins are the correct pins. I also know that there's some symmetry with the outputs and the inputs from both of these chips. What this lets me do is wire up the next three address lines and three data lines without looking at the schematic. So I'm going to continue on with the build, but while I do, I want to go over what we've learned in the playlist so far. In the first video, I used rubber ducks in pigeonholes as a metaphor for memory, and then I showed the difference between read-only memory, or ROM, and random access memory, or RAM. Then I went over the three main buses out of the 6502, the address bus, the data bus, and the control bus. Then over the next couple of videos, I wired those buses up to the RAM and the ROM, and I also built a circuit that can detect when the C1000 page is being accessed. Now I haven't used this circuit yet, but that'll be the focus of the next video. Then, right before your very eyes, I connected the 6502 to a ROM, RAM, with an Arduino Mega controlling it. Now the Arduino Mega snooped on the bus, or rather the buses, and it would send pixel data back to the PC for display. So it wasn't a truly independent system, but we did get to the point where we could display Apple II Pac-Man running. You might find some purists on the internet that argue that it's not a real retro system if there's an Arduino, and that it's somehow cheating, to which I have two responses. First, the goal isn't to be a purist, the goal is to learn as much as possible, and you build confidence by building systems that work. So starting out with the simplest system possible makes a lot of sense. Unnecessary complexity that you can't debug just drains your confidence. And second, if you do want to be a purist, how about you build your own CPU? Why don't you jump over to the Turing 6502 playlist and have a look at what's being built there? Links above. I want to make some commentary on the build at the moment, so I'm going to jump back to what you see on the screen. I need to lay down the fourth address signal and the fourth data wire. I'll clean up the pads a little. This time I'm just going for a single loop around the pin. Solder it and break off the excess. Form it into shape. Solder the other end, and we're done. Now I need to check the schematic again. I want to do a bit of planning here. I want to lay down the fourth wire, but its path is going to go directly over the fifth data wire. So what I'm going to do is solder in the first part of the fifth wire, and then finish the fourth wire. And the whole reason I'm doing this is to avoid touching the fourth wire with the soldering iron while I solder in the fifth wire. Just little bits of planning like this can just make the build a lot easier. Unfortunately, you often realise after the fact that you should have done it a different way. Now I'm going to remove the rest of these wires, connecting the D-type flip-flop up to the shift register. And I can tell I've used double loops here because they're not giving up without a fight. The main goal here is not to touch any of the red wires. It actually feels a bit like that game of Operation we used to play as a kid, where if you touch the sides, you've got this nasty buzzer. The problem is here, if you touch one of the red wires, you could expose the wire within, and that just leaves the potential to a short with one of the pads. If I wasn't confident I could get at them though, I could remove some of these ties for the red buses and just move them out of the way. I probably should have done that, but also I don't want to move the wires too many times unnecessarily if I don't have to. Now I'm not quite sure what I was thinking when I cut this wire, because it doesn't seem to fit on either pathway. If I go through the middle of the chip, it's too short. If I go down the side, it's a bit too long. 
but I think it naturally makes more sense actually to go down the side. So I'm going to choose that route and just try and cut a little bit off with the soldering iron. This plastic shielding is actually quite resistant to heat, so you need to be quite careful to get it just hot enough to remove it, but not too hot to make an absolute mess of it. Again, you'll notice that I've changed sides of the chip. Those for me with wiring up these sort of EEPROMs will know why. Running down the left side of the chip, it's A8, A9, A11, chip select, or output enable actually, then A10. These patterns kind of get burnt into your brain after a while, and allows you actually to wire these sort of things up without a schematic pretty easily. Except it looks like I spoke too soon, this one's too short. So I'm going to use my soldering iron to make an extension with some of the adjacent shielding. So it actually means there'll be a short break in this wire in the shielding. I'm going to tie down this group of wires near that break just to make sure it doesn't touch anything in the future. I'll finish this group of wires that I'm wiring up now. Then I'll connect up all the ground signals I need to the extra pins on the EEPROM. While I do this wiring, I'm going to jump back to the discussion about the playlist. So after part 7, where I got Pac-Man to play on the 65CO2, I wanted to develop an independent display system. I didn't want to have to send pixels to the PC. I started a video on the EEPROM-based raster generator, but I realised I wasn't doing a very good job of explaining it. Given that this isn't exactly how the Apple II generates video, I decided to build a raster generator somewhat similar to Apple II's raster generator on a breadboard, but even actually simpler than Apple II's raster generator. I spent a whole video on horizontal sync, then vertical sync. Another video on how Steve Wozniak's addressing schemed work for video memory. Then a fourth video on the actual bring up, just to show that it does really work. Once that was done, we went back to the EEPROM based design and built a finite state automata, or state machine, that counts through all the memory locations in a video sequence. Now, fortunately, the Western Design Center 65CO2 has a bus enable signal. This meant that we could give the video circuit access to the static RAM while clock was low, and the 6502 could get access to the memory system when clock was high. This really simplified the design and justified the use of the Western Design part. Programming the EEPROM to act as a raster generator is a little bit tricky, so I spent an entire video on that. And it's not completely finished. I'll need to do a little bit more work to get color fully debugged. I was actually planning to do the disk drive bring up for this build, but I want C1000 memory accesses to halt the processor using the ready signal. And this just turned out to be a bit more complex than I was expecting, so I'll do a whole video on that next. The reason I need to hold the CPU for these C1000 page addresses is because the Arduino will actually be servicing these requests. And this includes things like the keyboard, the disk drive, and all the soft switches. But the Arduino might be doing something else or servicing an interrupt, so there's no guarantee how long it'll take to service these requests. In high res mode on the Apple II, we have this RLN, which is relative line number. This goes to address lines A10, A11, and A12 on the memory system. But relative line number isn't used as part of the computation in text mode. Instead, the relative line number signals go directly to the character generator. Here I've called RLN line 0, line 1, and line 2. And these go to address lines A0, A1, and A2 of the character generator. Now these signals originate in the raster generator EEPROM, but if you'll recall, I had a second 74HC374 connected to the output of the EEPROM but only for the upper eight address lines. Previously, I used the upper three bits to generate active and a whole bunch of other signals, but now I can use the next three bits below that for relative line number. If I'd used A10, A11, and A12 off the address bus, this would flip every half clock between the CPU and the raster generator. Relative line number should actually be stable for an entire line, so this will just make the signal much easier to use. Let's look at the Apple II memory map, and I'm only going to worry about page 1 addressing at the moment. The text page goes from 400 to 7FF hex. Meanwhile, the high res page goes from 2000 to 3FFF hex. As I've currently programmed it, the raster generator will sweep through address 2000 to 3FFF for the active portion of the display, and if possible, I'd like to keep the same raster generator sequence. 
if for no other reason, just to keep the same sync sequences as I switch between high res and text mode. Otherwise, if I'm not careful, we'll get a noticeable flicker when we change mode. To achieve this, I'm going to use the 74HC257, which is a quad 2 input multiplexer. When pin 15 is held high, the part is disabled, and the outputs become high impedance. Now I'm going to connect this output enable up to clock. So when clock's low, and the select input, pin 1, is low, then the green pathway will become active, and from the memory's perspective, it'll see an address between 400 and 7FF. However, if pin 1's held high in high res mode, then instead the video memory will see VA10 through VA13, which means the memory system will see 2000 to 3FFF. And this is exactly the behaviour we want. I'll worry about page 2 accesses when I do a cleanup video later on. So now I need to wire in the 74HC257 in the schematic, connect the outputs to the address bus, I need to intercept A10, A11, A12 and A13 and connect them up to the 74HC257 and I'm going to make a new bus called VA10 through 13. Connect these new signals to one set of inputs on the multiplexer. I'll set the other input on the multiplexer to 01 hex. But because of the bit position, it'll be seen as address 400 by the memory system. When clock's low, I want this 257 to be active. But when clock's high, I want the output to be off so the CPU can have access to the memory. So I've put in place this 74HC257 to allow different parts of the static RAM to be accessed for the various display modes. This is where things could start getting a bit hairy. I've got to disconnect four address lines between the raster generator and the main address bus. And it just so happens these are the four lowest address lines on the 65CO2, so I got a bit lucky and have pretty easy access there. I wouldn't like to be getting access to A0 through A3 at this point. Now it could be argued that if I designed the whole thing from the start, I wouldn't be running into these sort of problems. That's a fair criticism. But part of the fun is actually coming up with these solutions to the problems that you've created for yourself. One of the reasons I like working with this sort of perf board is that you can actually iterate the design as you go along. If you're building a PC board, you have to do the design up front. But I prefer the iterative approach, and there's much more instant gratification when you build a section and get it to work. I'm actually very excited to get text mode working. It'll be a major milestone for the project. I haven't really discussed yet how I'm going to switch between the modes. The display mode is controlled by the CPU writing to some of these special C1000 locations. The plan is to have the Arduino intercept these memory references, and in turn, it'll produce some outputs for the mode and for the page number. Now, assuming the page number's high for page 1, I can connect it up to pin 2, and the inverse up to pin 5. That way, when page is high, we'll be accessing the page from 400 to 7FF, and when page is low, we'll be accessing the page from 800 to BFF, which is what we want to have happen. Switching the video mode to high res mode page 2 might be a bit trickier. What I'm thinking of doing is connecting up both a mode and a page signal to the raster generator. I have plenty of space left in the raster generator, so what I'll do is generate four copies of the raster. I'll leave three copies identical, but the fourth copy, which is for high res page 2, I'll switch all the memory references from the 2000 to 3FFF range to be 4000 to 5FFF. Now I'll explain this all in a bit more detail later on, but if I use four copies of the raster generator code, then I should be able to switch between them and not upset the timing of H-Sync and V-Sync. I haven't yet decided how I'm going to handle low res mode and mixed mode. For now though, I just want to get this text mode working. We're coming to the end of this video. In the next video, I'm going to be looking at the ready signal and the circuit that I'm going to need to have the Arduino stop the microprocessor when the C1000 range is hit. I suspect that the next video will actually be the last build, but let me know in the comments if you prefer the music 
or me chatting over the top of it. I'm going to try something different. I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and try a bring up without testing the individual parts. Let's see if it works. Let me turn it on. Looking good. And Apple. Excellent. Don't worry about the rubbish on the side of the screen. I'll get rid of that a bit later. If you haven't already, like, share, subscribe.